Today is Sunday, May 8, 2011, and to all you moms out there, happy Mother's Day. Uh, we are a live call-in public access atheist uh, television show based in Austin, Texas, dedicated to promoting positive atheism and the separation of church and state. We are also available to an international audience through our live stream at ustream.tv. Check out the website for more details about the show and our parent organization, the Atheist Community of Austin. Uh, that's at www.atheist-community.org for the uh, uh, for the organization or uh, www.atheist-experience.com for the show. You can also provide feedback by visiting the unofficial show blog, atheistexperience.blogspot.com, or email us at tv at atheist-community.org. Uh, if you enjoy the show today, then please come join us for dinner after, beginning at around 6 at El Arroyo on 1624 West 5th Street here in Austin. Uh, that's all the announcements I have for today. Okay. How are we doing? We're doing good. Okay. We're doing good. Well, today we have a, a special guest um, calling in, and so I apologize to um, all the other callers. Uh, this call may take the whole show, but we're going to kind of have it a, an open show, open okay. discussion and, and uh, chat with uh, a, a man by the name of Greg, Greg Paul. He's an independent researcher in sociology and evolution, and he has investigated scientifically the problem of evil, which is kind of interesting in itself. <laughs> He's investigated where religious belief comes from and, and what, what are the, the, the things that help it come into being. Go ahead and put him on the line. Okay. He, he has uh, pointed out the strong correlation between religious belief and societal, dis societal dysfunction. He has single-handedly blown away the myth of religious belief being necessary for a healthy society. Um, more recently, on April 30th, he wrote a piece in the Washington Post with Paul Zuckerman, uh, dispelling some of the myths and biases to which atheists have been, become subject. And so we have him on the air, and hopefully, uh, hopefully he's hearing us. Paul, are you there? Or, yep. Hi, Greg. Greg. How are you? How are you guys doing? Awesome. Great to have you on. I'm glad to be here. So you've uh, recently written an opinion piece in the Washington Post called Why Do Americans Still Dislike Atheists? Why do they? That's the, one of the titles. The other title in, in the Washington Post um, print version is Don't Dump on Atheists. Okay. I don't know why they have different titles. And also the uh, co-author's name is Phil Zuckerman. Okay. Phil Zuckerman, not Paul, I think. I'm sorry. Sorry. Um, and this is a lifetime goal of mine to get published in a uh, national newspaper. It's one of the things I've been trying to do. It is a challenge, well, isn't it? Congratulations. Well, as part of my aim, um, I'm not an academic sociologist. And what I'm trying to do over time is to get information that sociologists haven't already done and get it out there to the public. So this was a major achievement, is getting an op-ed on this into one of the two top national papers. Mm-hmm. Well, congratulations. So, so are atheists uh, beat up on, and, and uh, are we getting dumped on? Oh, yeah. Um, you can't get, basically, you can't get elected to, to office in this country. There are a couple of people who are atheists, right? And, uh, uh, let's get, name those, because that is an important issue there. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. um, oh, no, oh, oh, name, name Pete, Pete Stark is, Pete Stark is one, that. but he, he's never run as an atheist, so that's... That's certainly, uh, so your, your comment still holds true in the sense that uh, I think if you're an outspoken atheist and you're an unknown element and people don't know who you are, that is a, a big strike against you. Uh, who was the person you said? Pete Stark. Uh, Pete Stark. Okay, what about Al Franken? I, I don't know. See, okay, I listened to his show like almost all of them while he was on the air. Um, and... I got the impression that he still has that sort of desire to be a vague spiritualist, okay. uh, but he, yeah. a lot of times he came pretty close to, um, I, I mean, he's a comedian, so uh, one of the things he does is that he sort of makes fun of established power, and that's one of the reasons why so many comedians love kicking on religion is because that's a big uh, s social element that, that says you may not question this. And if you're a comedian, that's, that's just, yeah. you know, painting a target sign on it. So, the, so you know, basically in general, it's incredibly hard in this country. It's an outrage. If, if Jews were treated that way or blacks, it would be, you know, how could this be accepted? But here you have a big chunk of the American population that just because they don't believe in the supernatural 
are, are discriminated against. Yeah, right. well, one, of, one of the games they like to play here in Texas is the Texas State Constitution has a clause that you have to believe in God to, to, become, to be elected to public office. Of course, it's been made moot by the, the U.S. Constitution, so it's invalid. But, but the religious extremists love to bring that up and, and, and try to browbeat uh, people who are, who are potentially running for yeah, office. Yeah, I seem to remember that in this last election, one of, the, uh, one of the people running for Senate or representative, I'm not sure which, uh, brought up like, you know, this person can't really run for office because it's against our state constitution. It's right. incredible. It's ridiculous. Yes. Again, if you yeah. did this against other minorities, it would be considered unbelievable. Mm -hmm. And, you know, isn't the, the mayor of Houston is gay, right? Yes. I know oh. her personally, by the way. Pardon? I know her personally. Cool. But, and, and um, Barney Frank is gay. You know, there are a number mm -hmm. of prominent gays now that's considered acceptable. Mm -hmm. right. um, it's just with, with atheists, you are, it's beyond the pale still, which is unbelievable. Yeah, right. I, I mean, I think the difference is that, like, if you're black, it's still okay for people to be racist against you, but they have to put it in code. Mm -hmm. They they have to pretend that, it, that yeah, it's they have like, to go oh, to the, where, They have to go to the trouble of hiding it, right? <laughs> They have to say, where's his birth certificate instead of that guy's black. So right. with Jewish people, and even with gays, it's getting harder and harder to, so, to, to, yeah. to beat up on them. So, so Greg, do you see... of, And by the way, Bill, Bill Maher missed this on his own show a uh -huh. couple months ago. He said that gays were the only group that could still be discriminated against no, no. in this country. And then the Muslim panelists said, well, Muslims too, but even Bill didn't remember himself. Yeah. Right. Yep. And that's how chronic it is when Bill Maher doesn't remember. Right. <laughs> well, we've, we've had a terrible time in the mainstream media, too, right? Well, this is one of the cool things about this um, op-ed. And this is something I'm going to suggest that people start focusing upon. Mm -hmm. I have sent in, you know, I've been labeled the church's public enemy number one by MSNBC. Excellent. My hero. My hero. Yeah. <laughs> that was, a, was not an attack upon me. It was just a, a cool comment. And I was called, basically, characterized as un-American, the Wall Street Journal, that sort of thing. Okay. Um, Which is pretty cool. But what I've been um, also trying to do is get into mainstream publications. Mm -hmm. So I have been sending in op-eds to the Washington Post and New York Times ad nauseum. <laughs> and the rejection rate is, anyway, dozens to one. Mm -hmm. sure. And so I wasn't surprised. But uh, the New York Times has never heard anything from them, which is, I think, the way they are. The Washington Post, every once in a while, it would be a while before they would reply. And they would say, we can give you a serious consideration. We want to be able to accept it, but try again. <laughs> so I kind of knew that was a possibility there. Okay. At, they kept the door ajar, huh? Yeah. And at the... I went to visit a friend in Brooklyn Heights, uh, just across the East River from Lower Manhattan, and I was uh, at Christmas, and I was trying to, I was escaping that big snowstorm they had driving through Pennsylvania. The, the um, Don't Ask, Don't Tell had just been repealed, mm -hmm. so gays are making some gains here. There's some states gays can get married in, which has very important implications for the future religion in this country, by the way. <laughs> but I was th thinking about that, it's like, you know, atheists, we... I'm making any ground here. And then it hit me while I was driving through Pennsylvania, doing an op-ed making it into a civil rights issue. Sort of in the tradition of a letter from a Birmingham jail, Martin King's famous uh, tone that said, we've got to stop the bigotry against blacks. And I figured if I send that in, and I've also had some fellow researchers sign on to it, they're going to accept it. Mm -hmm. So I, I put it together, sent a copy to Phil, who I've worked with. He did a, a second version. Uh, Daniel Dennett signed on to it, by the way, oh, and great. a couple of other researchers mm -hmm. sent it in at the end of January. They accepted it the same day. I got a reply with an attachment to it, and when you see an attachment, you know they're they're, they're doing something with it. So I said <laughs> it's been accepted. Fantastic. And your heart they only had they only allowed two bylines, okay. so I had to drop Daniel. Um, but. But the other problem was is that I felt so smart because I sent in it just after the Tucson shootings calmed down and I figured out a news break. That day, those people in Egypt decided they had to go have a rebellion. <laughs> no, and then Libya and Wisconsin stuff. And They're so a, selfish, aren't they? Tsunami, yeah. <laughs> Charlie Sheen. But the people of the Post were pretty apologetic about it, and I didn't even 
object because I didn't want it to come out in the middle of a news stream. So well, you, you know, it could have been worse. You could have sent it in right before that uh, that guy died. You know, last week. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, it was published just before that, but that's, that's okay. Mm -hmm. The whole birth certificate fiasco. Well, what? awesome, awesome. So maybe uh, maybe you can uh, hit a few of the points from your your op-ed um, for our audience who who hasn't maybe hasn't read it. Um, and, and talk about uh, maybe uh, some of the, th the, the things that are sort of unfair or, or that are, that are uh, wrong as far as uh, people's common perception of atheists. Well, one thing I did, did want to say was, and I was trying to bring out here, is the way for atheists to start getting published in the mainstream more often, I think, is to emphasize the civil rights issue. Say, we atheists are fed up with this. Why do we have to put up with being, you know, my own dad, my stepmother, I have a tense relationship with them because I, I refuse to believe in the supernatural. Mm -hmm. Why? Yeah, that's silly. Um, why is it kids can't, boys can't join the Boy Scouts? Girls can join the Girl Scouts if they're atheists, but boys can't. Why is this considered still somehow acceptable? So we really need to start pushing this. We want our civil rights like everybody else. And what they, another reason I think the Washington Post accepted the, the op ed is because it was done by researchers who have the data to show why atheism mm -hmm. is just fine. Well, that's something I, I admire about your work is that you've done some very serious uh, scholarly articles that have, that have really, I think, uh, nailed some of these myths that that a lot of people commonly believe. And I, I really, I really am very impressed with you doing that. And and uh, I've been kind of touting your your um, your Journal of Religion and Society article across national correlations of quantifiable societal health with popular religi religiosity and secularism in the prosperous democracies. Rolls off your tongue. <laughs> so that's been a, been a great article. I've, I've actually promoted it quite a bit, and I, I, I really uh, am thrilled that you, you did that. But you've also done some pos uh, you know, popular press articles, which is, which is great, so that you can kind of keep both feet in the, in the, in the water. So. Yeah, this, um, th this started about 10 years ago because I work in paleontology, dinosaurs, and evolution, and I got tired of the creationists claiming that if, you, if the society doesn't believe in God and all that, things are going to go to hell in a handcart. And I knew that wasn't <laughs> true, so I started doing some preliminary work, got some really amazing correlations, and decided, well, somebody else must have done this. I checked, nobody had, and that's how I started publishing on this. But I'm not the sole person doing this. Okay. Um, Phil, for example, is, is published some good stuff. There's, um, if you go to my website, which is www.gspaulscienceofreligion.com. Scienceofreligion.com, right? Pardon? Scienceofreligion.com. G, G, one more time, please. GS triple w gs paul science of religion dot com and i put up a pdf of the washington post um, op-ed and i also have a, a list of documentation just a bunch of papers that have, just a, a few years ago i was complaining about how little research there is on this but that's changing very fast there's a lot of stuff coming out now that, that uh, multiple papers sh sh confirming these correlations that the more religious societies are, the worse off they tend to be. Well, I think that's a great thing because I, I think it's a fruitful area for for research. And um, you know, if I were a young researcher, I'd I'd be very interested in that because uh, there's a lot of low hanging fruit there. I think. Yeah, like oh, there's tremendous amounts of stuff that needs to be done. For example, Phil Zuckerman's uh, Society Without God is a classic book he's written, where he went to Denmark and just interviewed people. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing. <laughs> you know, people talk about how people are inherently religious and interested in this stuff. What he documents is that the Danes just don't give a damn about most of this stuff. <laughs> they just, they just, some of them he asked, they, they would say, you know, I never really thought about whether I believe in God or not. <laughs> there were a few like that, and, and, when, and they mm. didn't really want to talk about it anyway. It was boring to them. Uh, they just don't, they don't worry about the afterlife. They don't care about they're going, it. They're going to die, but okay, so what? You know? Well, that'd be, that'd be nice. Uh, you know, we, we kind of joke that uh, we, we belong to an organization whose, whose goal is for it to not to exist. <laughs> yeah. No. Uh, ideally, ideally, there shouldn't have to be atheist organizations. So. Yeah, but you're right. It's, it's difficult to dig up uh, social studies uh, on, uh, on the way that atheism affects population. And, uh, for instance, I know that one of the things that's brought up in uh, atheist discussions over and over again by people who want to have statistics available is this 1999 study about uh, prison incarceration and religion religious preference. Mm -hmm. Are you familiar with that one? Uh, I think so. 
Yeah, I, I mean, but the problem is, uh, for one thing, it's like 12 years old now. Uh, and, and people don't do these kind of studies periodically. And for another thing, the study itself doesn't seem to sort of control for, uh, you know, whether they became uh, religious before or after they were uh -huh. in prison. And so there's always sort of that way to weasel out of the statistics which say that atheists are way, way underrepresented in prison compared to how many of them there are in the general population. Yeah, these religious studies are very tricky, right? Because yeah. people's professed religious beliefs yeah, may be, be very different. The interesting thing was that when Daniel Dennett was... Uh, took a look at this before he was going to sign on. We had the prison thing in there, and he wanted it taken out because he uh -huh. didn't. He doesn't trust the statistics. I, I can understand that. Yeah. And he's got a point there. So it, it is true. I think people do overemphasize the prison thing. What, it, what it's really it's, it's really what we can look at these big societies, the first world nations, and compare them, and we can see what's really going on. Mm -hmm. So, so, so what, what, what are the kind of findings did you yeah, have? Yeah. Go ahead. Well, um, what I've done is I've taken this long list of major indicators, and I'm going to expand it, too, as, as my work develops. Mm -hmm. You know, basic homicide rates, um, incarceration rates, abortion rates, teen pregnancy, income disparity, alcohol consumption rates, a whole bunch of things, and about two dozen indicators. And I've constructed what's, what I call a successful <laughs> society scale, which allows me to rank, you know, I do statistical analysis, and to rank how well off various countries are in the first world. And I, I do the advanced prosperous democracies because they're fairly relatively uniform in terms of income and heritage and that sort of thing. How many of them are there? I mean, it seems uh, like you've run into... Uh, basically, the top dozen and a half in terms of income that were, had been surveyed by this International Social Survey Program Religion 2 poll t done at the turn of the century. So that seems like you might run into criticisms of having a small sample size, which kind of no, 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 no. This is no? this is this is wide swaths of, of the world's population. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like 800 million people. But uh, but I mean, it's difficult to compare whole countries when there's so few of them in total. But but, but you know, it, it's sufficient. And I never had a review problem when I put these papers in for review. So it, mm -hmm. it's, it's acceptable. And it also, if you start doing second world and third world nations, although it has certain advantages, it also, you're starting to get in extraneous factors like income levels and, yeah. and political, and also Corruption you don't want to look at dictatorships compared to democracies because that's a problem too. So, uh, Greg, so, uh, while we're kind of on the subject, uh, on the other measure, on the on the, the social ills that you've picked or the social me metrics, have you have you run into any uh, questions about uh, you know are you cherry picking the data here or or is this really a representative of, of societal health? Well, basically, I'm throwing in every major indicator that's considered reasonably valid to use for these sort of comparisons. Uh, the one area that people can get uptight about are, are crime because I only do homicide. Mm -hmm. But there are a number of uh, studies who just basically scream that the only valid comparison of crime rates between nations is homicide because it's basically somebody's dead and has, has been murdered. Well, it's certainly uh, The other stuff is just you get into really serious cross-comparison problems. For mm -hmm. example, reported rape rates in the United States are twice as high as in any other um, industrialized nation and like 12 times higher than Japan, mm. but that's almost certainly not real. That's probably has something to do with the way that rape is Cult defined in this country and how we yes. report it. Yeah, I see what you're saying. So it's the same with um, assault. What, what, assault in Germany is not defined the same as in Sweden or Canada the United States. Ah, uh, I see. So it's just a whole bunch of problems there. I see. And even then, if you do compare the rates, the United States still doesn't do very well. But um, So I did this, all these indicators I could get at the time, and what I did is I, I, I came up with a system for scoring them from zero to ten, ten being the best, zero the worst. Um, it, way it works out is the most secular nations, like the Scandinavian nations and Japan, are score like seven to eight, very high, while the United States is below three, as I recall, and is a very nice gradation. Mm -hmm. well, why we, do you hate America? <laughs> <laughs> it's not my fault. And I did what we called Pearson R correlations, and they came out very high rates. And we also did it on each each factor individually. And again, in most regards, the United States is really in, in terrible shape. You know, we have the shortest lifespans among developed nations, the highest juvenile mortality rates, which is really scary how that correlates with religiosity. Right. Yeah. High abortion rates. High, high homicide rates. Insane incarceration rates, highest abortion rates, teen pregnancy, mm -hmm. 
Um, you know, fair, some things we do fairly well. In yeah. suicide, we're typical alcohol consumption. We actually do fairly well. High per capita income. But terrible income disparity, the worst in that, fa that factor. Mm -hmm. So it seems like uh, what you're doing is kind of very preliminary work, that you're saying, oh, there's a correlation here. But um, I, you know, a lot of us uh, in the peanut gallery are really looking for causation, right? We want to we want to know whether religion is causing these things. I I think in many cases you can make a strong case it is, but it, it would be uh, perhaps just an armchair argument. And I was wondering if you had done any any work in that area or had some pointers to this is some of the cool stuff. When I started this, I had no idea how far it would take me. Uh, I thought I was just going to do some disproof of this argument that that many religious people and fundamentalists make that religion is important for societies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But what we, the, the, and this again is not entirely original to me, although I've taken it somewhat further than other people. Uh, what is the name of that book by um, Sacred and Secular by Pippa Norris and Ronald Englehart, a classic book that came out about five years ago, Cambridge University Press. Mm -hmm. And basically what happens is, is that as societies become well run, prosperous, people are, are, are secure, people lose interest in religion. And that's because religion is a superficial opinion that's pretty easily cast off when a society's run well. Religion is not integral to people. It's not deeply set in most people. Um, it so, can so it's the pacifier that people suck on to, uh, to comfort themselves when, when things are going bad, huh? Sure, and so, so many uh, s supposedly inspirational religious stories uh, are basically focused around misery. I mean, uh, you know, we had a fairly typical email come in say, saying, you know, how can you not believe in God? I was at a low point in my life, and I was divorced and a single mom, and I had all, you know, I had I drug abuse, to Jesus, and, blah, blah, and blah, my yeah. life was falling apart, and then I found Jesus. And it's like, I've never had all that bad stuff happen to me, so I don't, <laughs> uh, you know, so, so this is terrible business for religion because, uh, you know, it, without the misery, how are they going to suck more people into the church, right? <laughs> well, it's also, you know, the, 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 the couple stumbles out of their house in Texas, this has been wiped out by a tornado, mm -hmm. which according to Christian doctrine was sent by God, and they're thanking God for saving them. Yeah. <laughs> never There's a lot of ironies the in that. down the street were killed off, but they, God saved them. <laughs> right. Praise Jesus. <laughs> yeah. Well, God can't lose, like we always say. So I, I think I've heard you on other podcasts sort of making the claim that, that religion sort of thrives on um, dysfunctional societies. Is that, is that true? It, it, it's the, there's no such thing as a well-run society that's highly religious. It's never happened. Every wow. time societies are run well, religion falls off. Consistent can, relationship. Can you and, give and, us an, examples of well-run societies? Um, that Sweden, Wouldn't be the US. Norway, Finland, Denmark, England, France, Spain, Germany. Are we Canada, talking all twentieth and twenty first century? Pardon? Are we talking all within this century? Uh, you know, did Tocqueville noted that the United States was more religious than Europe back in the 18, early eighteen hundreds? Mm -hmm. Although Europe still was much more religious than it is now. The really good statistics come in after the war and show a you know, like church attendance rates, look at some of the charts, they just plummet off. It's really amazing. Either that or religion was already low. But it's basically since World War II in the latter part of the 20th century, and it's still occurring. There's no evidence of that this is plateaued off or much less reversing. This is a very, it's really consistent. The, running a society well is a, a dangerous enemy to religion. Do you think that maybe uh, there could be a, like also a correlation clearly visible here in the United States if you compare the religiosity of certain states with, uh, with their economic health, let's say? Uh, say it again. Do you think that you could do like a, a, a state by state well, study yeah. that's, that's similar? That's been done. One of the papers mm -hmm that I cite with the Washington Post um, PDF on my website. Um, let me see if I can... You, you don't need to pull it up, but... <laughs> no, it's, um... Yeah, it's, it's, it's this paper that just came out in Evolutionary Psychology. It's an online... It's the same journal I published in. It was okay. published last year, and I can't even really pronounce the, guy, last, the guy's last name. It's an unusual name. But, um... This is being done, and he, he basically got a similar set of correlations. Yeah, you even, I think you even mentioned it 
in the Washington Post article about uh, you know the disparage of uh, murder rates in in some of the southern states versus which yeah, are that, religious. So, to a certain extent, I was re referring to that evolutionary psychology article, and Phil Zuckerman's also done some of that. Mm -hmm. So it, it the, the northeast United States is the most least religious part of the country, and it has relatively low rates of dysfunction. The southeast the most religious, and it has the the biggest problems. Mm -hmm. Yep. Well, we're always pointing to you know Lubbock uh, as, as as one of the the cities here in Texas with the highest teen pregnancy rates, and it's like okay, well that couldn't have anything to do with with uh, the the religious belief there and and the 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 the, the sabotage of of sex ed. <laughs> well, what, uh, also now it it is probably true that conservative religion it, it contributes to societal dysfunction. Liberal religions tend to be fairly secular anyway. It doesn't make that much difference, probably. But the conservative religions, because they have, you know, they're basically trying to run societies as though it was 2,000 years ago, and those societies weren't very well run. Um, they want to, their policies are very dysfunctional. Mm -hmm. so, they, they're against um, good, comprehensive sex education, so teens don't use enough protection when they do have sex. For, oh yeah, that's been guns. really well documented. That abstinence only just doesn't work and has has a negative impact, in fact, on just about everything. Yep. Yeah. Well, they're you know they're big on guns and that's a problem, but there also there's a major issue here that's not been fully paid attention to, and that is the religious right is an advocate of social Darwinism, and it's just amazing to me, and I, I don't understand ironic. why Rachel Maddow doesn't talk about this and so on, uh -huh. but. You know, the Bible demands if you're a good Christian, you're a communist. Yeah. <laughs> it's just right there in Acts 2, 4, and 5, yep. Christians run communist churches where the people who don't turn over the property of the church die. Mm -hmm. And they, and American Christians have turned it to reverse it into you have to be an Ayn Randian, and Ayn Randian was a flaming <laughs> atheist. Yeah, I know. That's yeah. really crazy that right. they and have they're, they're seemed against to have such Darwinism an when they're social Darwinists. What is with these people? Yeah. Well, you have a you have a great quote on that in one of your articles. That, uh, let me let me read it real quick. These these conservative forces have favored the deregulation. Uh, deregulation, re deregulated, reduced taxation, especially for the wealthy. Uh, free market economy that raises personal risk. As a result, the religious right is the main opponent to Darwin science has become a leading proponent of what has been labeled um, socio socioeconomic Darwinism. So, so there's a big irony there, right? They don't believe in in evolution, but but here they are, you know, creating this this uh, sink or swim, survival of the fittest sort of. And, and I started culture. doing this when I talk to a conservative Christian. I started saying, "Why aren't you a communist?" And they look at me like I'm nuts, and I said, Acts 2 and 4 and 5, and it freaks them out because they don't know how to deal with that. And, of course, most of these people haven't read these things. Yeah. Anyway. They deny that that's in yeah, there, We've right? seen some of this free market push, and it's a head-scratcher, right? Why, why are religious people pushing for free markets? Right? I know why it is. It's yeah. because they're Christians and they're Americans. Okay. They, they love being Christians and they love being Americans. And, of course, American is capitalism, you know, hyper-capitalism. Therefore, it must be God-ordained. Yeah. And My favorite for... example of that, you mentioned Al Franken earlier, and uh, he, he quoted Rush Limbaugh saying that the Bible says, teach a man to fish, and, you know, don't give a man a fish, teach a man to fish. And he says, no, that's a Chinese proverb. The Bible has the bit where Jesus feeds everybody with fish. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. And, you know, he said that the, a wealthy person's getting into heaven is like a camel passing through the eye of a needle. Yeah, right. but you know, the right. needle is just a really short gate, so it has to just be a little camel. But, but it's, <laughs> I, I know what That's you're saying, you're, you're right, but still, he's basically <laughs> pointing out that it's hard, being wealthy is not good for him. Um, and, and that brings yes. up another interesting thing. There was just an article in Atlantic Monthly pointing out that rich people are not happy mm -hmm. because it's really difficult to have a lot of money for a lot of reasons. So we have a country that's running on two premises that we should be godly and rich. Neither of which is dealing is as a way of really being happy. Mm. It's a very we, we have a, a terribly dysfunctional nation in a lot of ways. It's well, well, a great whole, nation in a lot of re regards, but it's really messed up. Well, the whole godly thing is is not being happy here. It's being happy in the next world, right? <laughs> That's the whole purpose of that. <laughs> to hell with happiness here. <laughs> and, and another example of how the religious right is is causing problems is that they're opposed to universal health care. Which, of yes. course, not only costs a lot less than the system we have, but would save lives. The reason we have such a we have low lifespans and, and high juvenile mortality is because we don't have a universal health care system.
Yes. Right. Of course, we always want to tread lightly around these topics since we have a lot of audience members who, uh, while atheists, are fairly conservative. Ayn Rand. And, yeah, that, there's that. Yeah, yeah um, there is. And, you know, atheism is not a particular uh, political system. But what I'm doing is looking at the sociological research. What it shows is that progressive societies are the ones that, that have the lowest rates of societal dysfunction, and they are not very religious. Right. And this, the religion part is because, again, if you run a nation well, then people are prosperous and happy. You know, if it's a Sunday morning and you've got, you don't worry about your health care because it's paid for by the government in some way or has some universal system, and you've got a reasonably secure job, and if you do lose it, you're going to be helped out by the government. And so on, what are you going to do on a Sunday morning? You're going to go to church and pray for God to keep you from going bankrupt, or which, you're not, which is not going to happen, or go for a hike? They go for a you, hike. Might, you might have to go to work. <laughs> you might have to work s several jobs. Yeah, we have a lot of insecurity in this country as far as um, you know, people's uh, sense of prosperity, and people are, are very concerned about, you know, I'm, I'm just you know, a few paychecks from bankruptcy, or, or it wouldn't take very long before... You know, or, or, or one one devastating, one big illness would would wipe out you most people uh, financially, right. uh, and that's that's very scary. Yeah. You can be upper middle class, have the big McMansion and the SUVs and the nice vacations, and you can be ruined within a year or two. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, it doesn't happen in Europe. Yeah, uh, it doesn't take much here. I'd like to ask: uh, Have you gotten much email feedback as a result of this prominent article in a very top newspaper in the country? Well. The, the, it's kind of interesting. On the one hand, this has really taken off. Mm -hmm. It got 1,500 comments, which is very rare. Um, it's got over 70,000 Facebook recommends, which is amazing. Um, and I think what's happening here is a lot of American atheists are just fed up with being discriminated against, mm -hmm. and they finally see something in a major paper, and it's really exciting them. Um, so that's good. What I, I am bothered by is I haven't gotten reaction from the media. Okay. Even the progressive media. Now, maybe this has something to do with the Bin Laden thing. I'm going to keep working at this, but I'm going to keep pressing some of these people, including uh, the progressive um, programs like Maddow, to start getting involved with this. That's cool, and I hope Good. she does it. But actually, what I was really wondering is, did you get any cool hate mail? <laughs> no. No? Uh, really? I, there's one guy, Matt, is it Matt somebody? I can't remember his name. Matt he Slick? sent me an email saying, pardon? Matt Slick? No, I don't think so. No. Okay. Um, we know he, him. He sent me an email saying he has a blog that he had basically saying something to the effect that stereotypes are generally true. And uh. he was also denying climate change. <laughs> and basically, if he's going to do that, then he's going to be saying, oh, the stereotypes against Jews really are true. That's, that's what he's apparently doing. So I didn't respond to him. I, I'm okay. surprised, but I'd like to use that uh, as uh, to sort of loop back on something you said earlier, which is that you don't think that we are making much progress the way gays are. And I, I think... In terms of civil rights, in terms of right. the, uh, the, the United States is rapidly secularizing, uh, sure. the, there's a fast rise in atheism in this country, uh, and I have a pretty good idea of why this is occurring. But, I, but in I terms think of civil rights, it's, it's not nearly what it should be. That, that may be true, but I, I think what I've observed in uh, a number of years of hosting this show, show is that it's only been within the last decade or so that, that uh, sort of popular books on atheism ha have kind of taken off. I mean, like, until Richard Dawkins wrote The God Delusion, and I think before that was Unweaving the Rainbow, he mostly wrote science popularizing stuff where he would touch on the atheism a little bit, but then, uh, you know, it would be sort of tangential because he was really trying to talk about science. And he said in some of his books that people had advised him not to tackle the atheist issue head on. But since he has, a lot of other popular books have come out that, that you know about. And I think what I've observed from a social point of view uh, is that from more and more places that you wouldn't expect, people are just comfortable with the idea of casually uh, uh, mocking the idea of God belief. So I think there is some progress going on there. It is true that it's, it's becoming easier to go after religion. What has not quite been true is that it's become a lot more comfortable for atheists to say, oh, I'm an atheist and run for office and so on. Well, I think it's, it's becoming easier. It's, it's just not... Yeah, we're not we're not over the hump there. Yet. We're not over the hump, but uh, I, I think it is easier for people to be out, and uh, I think we see it with our show. We have a lot of people calling in, a lot of uh, people writing us who are out in their communities and who have, 
who are actually arguing with, with theists and, and doing the things that atheists do. Um, so I'm, I'm sort of heartened that, that I think the change is, is happening, but it is slow. It is very slow, uh, especially compared to the, the gay rights, uh, which has made great strides in the last 20 and 30 years. So, but, but you've made an interesting point. You've, you sort of said, uh, you know, groups like us, the atheists uh, waving the atheist flag and stuff, are, are going to get all swamped out. We're, we're, we're not making as nearly as big of an impact as the economic uh, and, and, and social, social security uh, in the broad sense. That, that that's really making a bigger impact on, on, on uh, religious belief, and, and that, that's really going to turn the tide. Yeah, the main factors determining religiosity are um, the development of modern science, which has undermined religion tremendously. Yeah, also, the gaps in the gut for the god of the gaps to hide in are getting smaller. Yeah, and it's just made it it's made it both plausible to be an atheist and kind of pushed it that way. It's it's it makes more sense to be an atheist now than to believe in a, a god creating the universe. Mm -hmm. um, but also the the, the economic pro secure economic prosperity I've been talking about. But also the corporate consumer culture. Um, that the, it's, it's an, again an amazing contradiction that the religious right has allied with the corporations and the Republican Party. But those same corporations are really, really screwing religion because they're not interested in people going to church on Sunday mornings. They'd rather have them at the Walmart and Home Depot. Right. <laughs> and the, you know, look and if they, Walmart look and Home Depot don't prominently display Merry Christmas, then they've got a well, bunch of crazy well, people boycotting. Well, I you know, think there the, used to be the blue laws that kept people in church or encouraged them to go to church on Sundays, and the, the corporate, the retailers got rid of those laws. Yeah. And, the, you know, yeah. the, the Walton's family, they're conservative Christians. They don't close their, their stores down on Sunday. Well, there's kind of a joke that, that uh, religion or capitalism is the U.S. is religion. And, it's, <laughs> and, and there's, I think there's a lot of truth to that. We're a very, very capitalistic uh, sort of society. And, and, and you're right. The, the capitalism has, has gone, gotten rid of a lot of these blue laws and these um, sorts of kowtowing to religious people. Um, well, uh, a great example of this is Rupert Murdoch. Because, of course, he runs Fox News, which is his, one of his cash cows, mm -hmm. and is, of course, hyper-conservative, pro-God, and all that. But what a, he, this is, he also runs the Fox Entertainment Empire, which <laughs> puts on The Simpsons, one of the most anti-religious shows on. Well, you know, with yeah. one arm, he gives people something to be outraged about, and then, and then with the he, other then arm, exactly, he, he makes the money outrage. on both ends. And this is really cool because he's, he's showing where the corporate suits really are. Yeah. Uh, what they did was they, they captured the counterculture. You know, the, the 60s came in, the counterculture, it freaked out the establishment for a while, but the corporate people realized, oh, we can use this. And they've basically mm -hmm. taken it over and, and are using it to, uh, they basically want to make Americans into hedonist, hedonistic materialistic consumers who are in debt perpetually <laughs> and yep <laughs> and that's what they've done and they've been very successful at it and you know you can complain about the corporate consumer culture or like it or you know i i both like it and dislike it but it is partly it is probably the main thing secularizing this country mm -hmm. because we don't have the so, kind of secure prosperity so should we be happy about that or not <laughs> you know to a certain extent i do the research and this is the conclusions i come to and, you know, some of it I like, some of it I don't. Okay. You know, what I, I call what the corporations have produced is a Sex in the City culture. <laughs> and I like Sex in the City. It's, it's a great show. And, um, and so, yeah, I'd like to plug life, HBO because the their, they new game, their new Game of Thrones series is pretty damn awesome also. Oh, okay. All right. But uh, anyway. So, sorry, Craig. <laughs> sorry. Go ahead. So, um... There are the major, you know, these major forces pushing all secular democracies away from religion, including even the United States. We're, we're behind the curve because we have the most second world type of high income disparity um, economic system, but we're, we're going down that same path. Well, maybe I have a biased viewpoint, but I, I feel like, uh, you know, we, the country is being run by religious nuts these days, and, and it's a little less so than in, in the uh, Bush W. W. Bush years, but uh, it's still there, it's still very powerful, and, uh, you know, is, is my perception wrong? Do I, have a, do I just have a biased perception because I'm dealing with religion all the time, or, 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 or what? what? It's both true and it's not true. It's, it's, it's a very complex situation. One thing I'm wondering, by the way, is did Obama read that op-ed? Because he, pro I assume he reads the post every every morning. But well, whatever about that. Um, I hope he does. I hope he does. Yeah, it would be, well, be cool if he didn't. He's met with atheist leaders once. So, I, I mean, he's not uh, anti directly opposed to it, yeah. apparently. But it's still kind of weird that it's it's somehow difficult for atheists to get into the White House. I mean, this is, again, another 
you know, example of bigotry against atheists. All right. Well, keep working on that. Yeah. And, I will. Um, uh, I think we'd like to get to some other calls in the okay. last 20 minutes, okay. but it has been a real pleasure having you on. Call back anytime, and if you're ever in Austin, come on down. Yeah, I'd like to, to uh, talk about my how I've just proven the existence of a benign God. Okay. Okay. That sort of thing. Well, um, get back to us uh, um, next week. Or I something. might do that. All right. Oh, you, you okay? Sounds okay. good. All right. Well, thank, thank you, you very calling. much, Greg. Take care. We appreciate your call. Bye. Sure. Bye. And as I was saying, Greg or any other atheist-friendly person could come right on down to uh, El Arroyo after the show at around 6 o'clock when we'll all get together and hang out with other godless people. Uh, thank you very much, Greg, for being on the show. Uh, it's been very edifying. And uh, let's move on We're going to take a few other calls? Yes. Great, great. Cord in Starwood, British Columbia. Have I got that right? You betcha. Hi. Well, thank you so, for holding. Yes. Thank you for holding for so long. Ah, you no know, worries. How are you guys doing? Good. Pretty good. <laughs> What's on hey, your so mind anyways, today? Uh, I'm a believer here up in Canada. Okay. And I, I'm no big deal. I'm no big hotshot or nothing. I don't have a great big education. But I am used to uh, debating with atheists. Mm -hmm. And uh, right off the bat, I want to say that I... I I'm not against atheists. I have a lot of atheists, and I love atheists. I have family members and uh, friends that are atheists. Okay. And uh, what I see a lot of the time is what I've noticed is I see them using intellect as a way to build a case against the Bible. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, is that the Bible tells us that it's actually a spiritual issue, not an intellectual issue at all. And, like, as an example, when I tell you turn from sin, what goes through your mind? I, I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. Your phone connection's a little shaky. When you tell me what? Like, like if I tell you to repent and turn from your sins, what goes through your mind? Well, oh, what goes I, through my mind is I can is answer that. that is, okay, go well, for it. <laughs> sin, sin is dependent on a notion of God and what pisses him off and what makes him happy, and there's no evidence for such a God. So it's a, it's a made-up construct to manipulate people. And if you're going to repent, you're, you're, you're being um, emotionally manipulated to hear. So, so I, think, uh, I think that this is all about emotional manipulation. That's what I... Okay, well, I mean, I, I, I can see your point there, but now is it okay if I share with a verse with you guys? You can, but you should keep the Star Trek rule in mind. Uh, <laughs> What's the Star Trek rule? The, the Star Trek rule is, is something that I used on, the, on our blog to uh, clarify to Christians that the problem with quoting the Bible to an atheist is that we don't have any particular uh, connection to it other than as a book of stories. So... If you quote a if you quote a uh, Bible verse to us, you should first ask yourself: Would this still be as persuasive to you if Captain Kirk was saying it? I understand where you're coming from. Um, I understand, uh, you know, it's, it's need to mock it and stuff. But this verse I'm might not. I'm mocking it. I, I mean, I hey, just. You know what? I'm used to being mocked. It's okay. <laughs> okay, but I'm not mocking it. All right. So, anyways, this this verse, it says. This is the condemnation, for light has come into the world. Mm -hmm. Men love darkness rather than the light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light. Either cometh to the light, lest his deeds be reproved. So you know what that basically tells us? Well, let me ask you another question here. You know, was, was it evil for, for Christians for maybe 1,400 years to persecute and kill Jews by the millions? Well, you know what? The Bible is against that as well, and I'm against that as well. You know what? But they use the Bible to, to to justify it. No, it doesn't. I can I can point at Bible quotes. You know, if we're quoting Bible quotes, you know, I can point at Bible quotes that were used to justify that killing. So. And I believe you, but you know what? Those quotes. You know what? Jesus said that the day will come when they will kill you in the name of God. Anybody that killed somebody else in the name of God is false religion. <laughs> But but the the Bi have have you read like numbers? Have you looked at have you looked at all the atrocities in the Bible? 
It's, 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 a, it's a genocide manual. Right. I mean, doesn't the Bible essentially have a whole bunch of stories where God directly right. commands the Jews to go out and kill right. entire neighboring tribes, kill right. all the men regardless of what they've done, take, take the women and take as their as women for, of war. For, uh, for their unwilling wives and, and the children? Yes, it does. You know what? That is the old Mosaic law. So that, <laughs> so that part of the Bible also, like, no longer applies? Adulterers and uh, homosexuals, they actually still are under a death sentence. Okay. We don't, we don't carry it out anymore. God's going to carry it out. Like, those crimes and those sins are still punishable by death. Even All right, this, this sounds, sounds like a whole pile it. of just so stories Right, but me. then we're getting back to what I said earlier, what, what I was trying to point out with the Star Trek thing is that's just a bunch of stuff that somebody wrote down. There's no, I mean, it's not like morally impressive enough that it makes me think, oh, a supernatural thing must have written this. Uh, and it's not that good a story that I think, oh, this must be true that it's in, because it's in there. Yes, I understand. And, uh... and everybody today is spinning the Bible a different way. You know, we talk to a lot of religious folks on this show, and everybody has a different concept of God. And like some people say, oh, hell is real, hell is real, be afraid. And other people say, oh, hell's not real, whatever. And, and any issue, people come on different sides. And, you know, uh, if, if you ask anybody in the world today, what color is the sky on a cloudless day, the answer is blue. Right, and that's because it's the truth. But if you ask uh, a bunch of religious people, you know, what about their God, you're going to get th that many different answers, which means to me that it's, it's, there's no objective reality there behind it. Well, you know what? The thing is, is the natural man cannot receive the things of God spiritually discerned. So, so churches, churches are, 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 uh, don't, don't, shouldn't exist, right? Because they're, they're false, right? Is that what you're saying? No, not at all. Like, it's foolishness to you because you're in the natural. You haven't had your eyes open, so it seems like foolishness to you. Okay. Well, but there's, right. more, there's more to it than you might believe, more to it than you think. Like, you actually investigated it with an open mind. We, we have done that. Or is it, I have, like, you hear repent and you don't yeah, want we have, to repent? I mean, so far it seems like you haven't really presented any particular reason to believe in God. You've just said that we're foolish not to because you say so. Oh, no, no, no. I'm not, I don't think you're foolish at all. Okay. Not at all. I, I actually, you know what? Of course, the atheists I know are very intelligent people, extremely, a lot more intelligent than me. How do you know that they're not right and you're not wrong? Well, because I've investigated the stories. And, and so have all these other people that you just said were very intelligent. So how do you know they I, haven't got it right? Well, because they're, they're ignoring the Bible. And, and that's the, me too. the problem. Me <laughs> too. Uh, we're only humans. We aren't as smart as God. Like, I think it's a, a good thing to ignore a genocide manual, personally. We can come up with all kinds of weird ideas, but it's not going to hold in the end because we aren't as intelligent as we Yeah, God, God's going to get you. But yeah. why wouldn't I ignore the Bible? Do you have a good reason for that? Oh, there's lots of good reasons. Like, Okay, name one. Example, them. well, look at the prophecies that are coming true. Like, it says in the last days, many false prophets will rise. Now, and I mean, you've got to admit, there's all kinds of false prophets and false religion everywhere. And I mean, that's part it's of your faith. And as far you know, as I'm, I'm against that stuff too. I'm against false prophets and prosperity yeah, gospel. That, and okay, religion. so the Bible says that people will say stuff that isn't true. That's really going out on a limb there. Well, that's not the only one. That's just one. I mean, uh, that's not, that's not a convincing that's one. That's not even <laughs> one. <laughs> you got one that's convincing? Well, have you looked at the archaeological archaeological evidence? Such yeah, as? things like uh, Nazareth, what didn't even exist when Jesus was supposed to have been born there. I, I mean, the Bible does mention some places that uh, that actually existed, but so does Spider-Man. I mean, Spider-Man lives in New York, and that's not a fictional place, but that doesn't mean Spider-Man is real, right? Yes, but you know what, see? Shut your, shut your eyes and shut your ears, and that's why I'm trying to explain to you that it's a spiritual issue. Okay, so so you don't have a reason. You just want me to believe because you say so. No, it's not. <laughs> That's all we've heard so far. Shut your eyes and shut your ears and, and shut believe your what brain you're telling off. us? Yep. <laughs> well, it, it has to do with investigating it with an open mind. If, if you're okay. investigating it 
all you want to find is that it's not true. No, 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 no. no. no I'd, I'd be looking very at the evidence. interested to know if it's true. But I, I'd love for you to actually present a convincing argument for why I should believe in That's God. That's right. You have the floor, man. Knock us out. Right, it's well, a great argument. How about this? Not to get into evolution, but, I mean, if you look in Genesis, mm -hmm. it says that all the plants and animals will reproduce at their own time. Okay. And uh, we know this today that the DNA it keeps all the animals reproducing after their own kind, like never morph into a completely different animal. And so this is totally in line with scripture. Okay, let, let me ask you something though. On what day did God create plants again? I can't remember off the top of my head to be honest with you. Okay, do you remember what day he created the sun? Again, I, I don't remember off the top of my okay, head. Okay, do you remember if the plants uh, were created by God before or after the sun was created? I was just making the point that they were reproduced after their own kind. Okay, but as I recall, the Bible says that plants existed before the sun did, which I don't think is in line with what scientists have discovered. Would you agree with that? You know what? There's a lot of good science out there. And there's a lot of false science. Okay, so it's false that plants can't live without sunlight. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> it depends for how long. Okay. I could be in the dark for three days. It's not going <laughs> to. Plants is not going to die. Oh, so so days. you're a six day creationist. Yes, I am. Do you think that that's what scientists uh, generally believe about the state of the universe? Well, the, the scientists of today have made a lot of mistakes, so I don't put a lot of faith into okay. what they say. So if it, so we've it's, seen the hoaxes and we've seen the frauds. I mean, we've, we've seen a lot of hokey science. I mean, some of it is good, but it, it's, it's, a, it's just, a self correcting uh, process. Consider them right. Why did you tell us? Why did you tell us a minute ago that the, that the Bible predicts stuff that science would eventually say when a lot of the stuff you believe is actually at odds with mainstream science? I mean, that doesn't seem like a very good argument to use. Well, what, what is at odds with mainstream science? Well, uh, let me see. Six-day creation? Okay, and what is their case against that? That's not the point. <laughs> the point is, you, w you a minute ago were trying to claim that uh, the Bible was predictive of what science would discover, but it seems like you only want to cherry pick uh, these uh, very vaguely similar things when they agree with science, and then when they don't agree with science, you want to say the science is wrong, not the Bible. Any place that the Bible contradicts science, it must be science that's wrong. That's actually is what I'm saying. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yes. No, that's that's exactly we we, we that's think that's like dishonest. Just, come up with things that are <laughs> just to be real clear. We right. know that an error has been, has happened. Something okay. a mistake has happened along the line. You yeah. still like have. Okay. They said you we, still we, haven't given a good reason yet why we would not dismiss the Bible. And in fact, the argument you just tried to bring for the Bible, you've just contradicted yourself. In what way? You, <laughs> do I have to do this again? Well, help me, Don. <laughs> you, you, uh, you know, religion uh, tends to start with a conclusion and discount any evidence that, that that doesn't support the conclusion. And you sort of admitted to doing that just now. And and uh, we we, right. so we that's like, like to the do, opposite of science. That's the opposite of science. <clears throat> science starts with the evidence and, and chases it wherever it goes. And and there's no bias. Uh, at least in the grand scheme, there's no bias. Uh, there, there may be individuals who have their own biases, but that comes out in the wash because there's peer review, there's all sorts of mechanisms to, uh, to replicate claims and, and, and falsify false ones and these sorts of things. So, so there's a whole process there that, that helps us get to the right answer. And lo and behold, at the end of the day, we get all this technology that comes out of science, and we can fly planes, and we can have television shows, and run computers, and that's the fruits of this, this great stuff. Um, religion really sort of has none of that. You know, they're sort of, they're sort of still telling the same stories that have been wrong for 2,000 years, and they're still getting the wrong answer, and there's no, no real good coming out of it uh, in, in, the, in, in the grand scheme. Um, we've only, we've I, I don't only know got... what to say. I mean, uh, we, there's a long list of things that have happened. Like, I mean, Lucy, Lucy was peer-reviewed. 
mean, that was a handful of bones with no face, just a skull cap. And now if you go down to the St. Louis Zoo, go have a look at Lucy. She's got human hands, human feet, human feet, and a half age, right. half human face. <laughs> now that past the peer review, like, that's pretty sad. I mean, uh, well, and that is biased. And, like, you and said to that you, they that biased, means that, that the Earth biased. could have been created 6,000 years ago. So, so you think you think you, the devil put, put Lucy there and, and we're just being deceived? Is that, is that kind of how, you, how you're coming at it? Well, you know what? I do believe the devil exists. Mm -hmm. Of course okay. I do. And just because you can't see the Where's devil you? and you can't see God, it does not mean he does not exist. You can okay. see the influence. And, and that's, that's the thing I'm trying to explain to you in a nice way is that when you're spiritually blind, you, you don't see the spiritual side of things. You only see the intellect and the logical side. You don't have any room for spiritual things that are going on. You yeah, know what I mean, and that's where yep. it stems from. And, and the New Agers will say my my chakras need aligning, and, and they'll charge me fifty bucks to do that. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> but you know, being Where's willing to believe stuff without good reason, there's a word for that. It's called gullibility. And we are almost out of time on the show, so thanks for calling in. We appreciate your call. Bye. All right, thanks, guys. Uh, so we've got like a minute left. Do a uh, quickie call. One, what? Qu one quickie call. Go, go, go. Okay, go. Sarah in New York. How, Hi, how are you? Um, yeah, I'll go quickly. My question is regarding um, indoctrination at home, because mm -hmm. I have some friends who were um, born and raised in a particular space, and in their later years, they claim that they choose to practice and hold these customs, but are not forced. And I'm wondering, are these people just kidding themselves about ever really having a choice when they're going exposed to one religion? Um, I think they're certainly influenced by their upbringing, but I mean, you could say that about me, having been brought up as an atheist. Uh, so, I, I mean, certainly people do change their minds, and, and I don't think that just because somebody believes the same thing as their parents necessarily means that they're brainwashed. <coughs> okay, um, I wanted to uh, extend that question further to uh, what your opinion is on um, on how high schools should incorporate religious studies into their curriculum? I, I would like to see study. more comparative I mean, religions, but we're out of time. Uh, tell you what, oh. I'll just put you on hold. Uh, I'll pick you up again after the show's over and we can keep talking. Um, oh, awesome. Okay, just hang on there. Uh, and that's our show. Thank you to our great crew who've already flashed by on the screen while I was talking. Come on down to El Arroyo and uh, Matt and somebody else. We'll see you next week. Thanks, Don. Thank you.